I would recommend taking up photography and just documenting your own environment. It's a great way to spend your year and it's a great way of meeting people and experiencing life. So I would recommend to anybody that they took it up. And if it leads to something and you do wind up with work out of it, nice one. But if you don't, you're certainly not wasting your time. Mm -hmm. Very few of us will be remembered. And it's a great thing to do. Once your grandchildren die, you're just going to be forgotten. They'll be the last people that will remember mm. most of us. That's why I think grannies and granddads are always really nice to the grandkids. <laughs> be nasty to the parents. You do that again, I'll whack you. I'll come here, my little darling, when you're the grandson. Joining me on the show today is legendary documentary photographer Rob Bremner. Rob left the small town of Wick in the far north of Scotland to pursue his dreams of being a photographer. He landed in Liverpool, where through divine providence he became a protege of legendary photographers Tom Wood and Martin Parr. But Rob had his own ideas and went on to capture some of the most iconic images of Liverpool in the 1980s and 1990s during a time when Northern Britain, especially Liverpool, were ground into the dirt by a heartless Tory government. The pictures Rob took when he was just a student lay buried in his collection for 30 years because until the digital revolution happened, exhibition spaces were controlled by cultural gatekeepers. And now, 30 years later, thanks to platforms like Instagram, Rob was able to bring light to his incredible record of the people of Liverpool during one of the most difficult periods in our history. It has special significance for me because I grew up in the areas Rob photographed during the time he was taking the pictures. So it's a touchstone for me in my own personal journey. And now it's time for our guest, Rob Bremner. Welcome to the show. How you doing, Rob? Oh, all right, Lawrence. Not yeah. too bad. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for inviting me. A big fan of your work, amazing photographs, and we're going to get into them today. We're going to do something a little bit different on the podcast today, which I haven't done before. We're going to have a cultural conversation, and uh, we're going to go through some of your most iconic photographs and talk mm. about the history of them, the background, what inspired you, your memories of them, and how it's you know affected your life. But before we get into that, maybe maybe start something a little bit closer to home to you. How, how does it feel now, like 30 years later, after taking some of these amazing photographs that you did um, when you were a student, I guess? How does it feel now that these photographs are having such a cultural impact upon our perception of British history or modern British history? How is that for you as, as a photographer? How does that make you feel? I'm not really sure. I'm not even sure of the impact because I've been in Scotland practically now for 15 years. I've been back to Liverpool a few times doing jobs. So it's very difficult for me because I'm not actually meeting anyone. You know, I, I just sort of live up here. I take a walk every morning and I, I go around. But what has been interesting is the feedback that I've gotten from the people that I photographed. You know, it's nice i'm not sure that they've had much of a cultural impact to be on I, I just don't look at things in well, that I, way you know for me it's about me sharing them on instagram or on social media well i think what's interesting isn't it is I, that what may have been difficult in the past to exhibit your work as a photographer now has become really easy in the fact that you have platforms like facebook and instagram oh, and specifically course. instagram which has become you know mm -hmm. the main platform for photographers and yeah. has given us the viewer an ability to see these amazing images that normally we wouldn't we'd have to go to a, an exhibition space or we'd have to buy a photography book yeah. and then you have to bypass the agenda of the people that are running the exhibition space mm. you know what i mean you don't have that freedom there because they have their own agendas mm. you know over what's fashionable what's worthy or what box is being ticked at this particular time, you know, and I don't feel as though my work really fits in to ticking boxes because I just photograph people. You know, there's no hidden agenda behind it or anything like that. You know, I just enjoy going up saying hello. You know, if I was attracted to Everton, it was because it was changing. 
you know, it's as a documentary photographer, you see this area being torn down. And I first started photographing the buildings, you know, whilst I was doing that. And then I got speaking to people and then just asking them, you know, excuse me, can I take your photograph type of thing? Because they're a part of, you know, it's their lives. It's their, where they grew up type of thing. And not to photograph them would have seemed a bit strange. I'm, I'm not that thought out when it comes to doing these things. I think you undersell well, yourself. I mean, there's, there's a real art to your photographs and maybe that's just a, a natural talent that you're able to capture that yeah. moment. But there is, you know, there is a deep kind of thought and process, I think, in, in your photographs, which we'll get into in a bit. You know, and, and is that something that you found that was natural to you? I found actually walking around, because I'm from a similar background to the people that I was photographing anyway, I always felt comfortable. Mm. I remember a friend from Liso, who I went to college with, who was telling me that Everton was rough. And I went, have you ever spent a Saturday night in Liso? And I felt very comfortable at that time whilst I was doing that, you know. That I wouldn't sort of look at somebody and think, well, I wouldn't ask Ken because he looks like trouble, because none of them did. You know, all the children were, they could be sort of cheeky in a Liverpool, you know, rascally manner, but most of the children as well. And the people, they were just very nice people. You know, the black and white stuff that I did originally, I would just ask people if I could come home you know, take some photographs in their flats. And I hardly remember anyone turning me down, you know, and considering that I was just a complete stranger wandering around with the camera. You know, I found them very, you know, I, there was one old guy who lived next to Latimer Street. And if it was raining, he would take me to the local pub, which was underneath one of the buildings that was later torn down type of thing. and. You know, I remember going back to his house with his wife and his wife cooking lunch for us. And I spent all afternoon watching Bob Hope on the road to Singapore or something like that. Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. You know, they were, and I still feel that about Liverpool people, they are incredibly generous. You know, if I tried that once in Bristol when, because I, I was in Newport at college at the time, and it was a pissing way afternoon and everybody just walked past me. You know, you go to Everton or you come to Liverpool, and I'd been in Wallasey. I'd studied there before I went to co went to Newport, and I found it quite easy photographing people. I'm not sure how much that would have changed in the last fifteen or twenty years, but I'd love to find out. But I'd, I've always found them. You know, even when I'd left college and things come, I was always invited to an opening, or somebody would be offering me a glass of free wine here, there, and everywhere. And I, I, I really do think that Liverpool is quite a wonderful city, and I think the people are probably some of the best people that I've actually met. Well, let's let's have a look at the first photograph that I picked out, and it's you, I imagine. Yeah. In, this is uh, East in Liverpool. Is this Liverpool? No, this is East Street. It was when I was living in Newport. We had this house that was next to a Chinese restaurant. Yeah. And it was like one, two, three bedrooms in it. The rooms cost six pounds a week. And this was the living room and the kitchen and outside there was an outside shower and an outside toilet and generally we had a rat problem and a mice problem and you know it was i wasn't very successful at women wanting to come home with me but, <laughs> you know it was quite barren yeah you know, one look at my front hall and it was like well i remember one of my mates once oh he came from Perth call and like his parents just wouldn't come in the door. You know, they took one look at it and went, no chance. That bottle of cider in the corner there. Yeah. Newport used to be the, it was like the most average town in Britain. And every time you walked out, you'd have to, you know, somebody would ask you to do some survey for some marketing of stuff. And that bottle of cider stayed there for a year and a half. <laughs> Nobody drank it because 
what would happen is that, oh, you want to drink that, help yourself. Somebody would take one sip of it and go, ah. And it was there for, it was there to the day I left college, actually. I think it's probably still there if the house is standing. Well, but, I, I know Newport quite well because my, my yeah. wife's from Newport. <laughs> and, oh. my, and my son was born in Newport. <laughs> yeah, so I know her quite well. Yeah, but you yeah. studied in Newport, didn't you? That was one of the places where you, you know, you learned how to do documentary filmmaking. Oh, yeah. Uh, documentary yeah, I, I actually got accepted to the documentary course that was run by a magnum photographer called David Hearn. So, you know, that's what I was doing when I was up. We had 12 picture stories to do and I, I wanted to go back to Liverpool to take photographs anyway. And I was printing with Tom at night whilst I was taking these photographs, you know, whilst I was whilst I was at college type of thing. Is this a self-portrait or is a friend taking this? A friend has taken that. It's a guy called Malcolm McDonald, my friend from Leso. We both went from oh. Wallasey to Newport. So did you travel down from Wick to go to Wallasey? Yeah, well, I'd originally applied to Plymouth. They wouldn't accept me. Uh, then I went to Redden for an interview and they wouldn't accept me neither, you know. And then I wound up, my third my third interview was with Wolsey College of Art and they accepted me. They regretted it, but they accepted me. I never passed the course. We had a really good head of course though, called Fred, who thought, well, at least this guy goes out and takes photographs for himself and he's interested. And it was a lot more flexible then, you know, in the 80s compared to now where you could make an allowance. What's this one? This one is like one of my favourites. It seems to be Liverpool in the 1980s. No, it's this been... is actually the early 1990s, about wow. 1994. I don't know who the guy is in the foreground, but the guy at sitting in the seat has been in contact. I think he works in insurance or something. I've got a name for him here in this book, but... You know, he's the guy in the background and I don't know who the kid is neither. I just stopped them one day when I was walking down Wood Street and said, excuse me, can I take your photograph? But you know what you it know, looks like to me? It looks like it's like, you know, skinhead culture from the 1980s. It looks like you captured yeah. the skinhead culture there. Well, the only person that's ever got in contact with me about this bloke was a girl and she just didn't give his name, said he wasn't very nice. But I wouldn't want to put that up because that's one person's opinion. You know, it could be an ex-girlfriend for all I know. He's definitely got a look in his eye though, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. just very difficult to try and judge somebody from 200, you know, what's that? That's about 60th of a second in Wood Street. Mm. One day, you know, I'm always wary when people try to judge people, you know, from such a short period of time, you know, it's a photograph. It doesn't really define anyone as an individual, you know, because this guy's got a skinhead, you know, I've known plenty of like Stu and people I knew that I grew up with. And when I first went to the oyster catcher in Liso, when I first arrived there, I went with my mate Malcolm and everybody in the entire place had a skinhead. Mm. And that was quite common as well, you know, getting your hair cut off. You know, probably most of them had grown up as hippies in the 70s, the early 80s. It They're all, all having changed. your photo. Yeah. Mm. So I'm I'm just dubious about, you know, judging people by photographs. Isn't that kind of what you're doing a, a little bit with documentary photography? Is, is oh, you're, you're capturing a, a moment, a brief, an almost oh, infinitesimal yeah. moment in time. And in some ways, you know, because your pictures are now being looked at with such enthusiasm it's like you've immortalized this guy to a large degree in, the, in this moment in time and we're projecting all of our kind of um ideas upon the photographs aren't but we, we like do how that we understand the them. we walk down yeah. the street and then you'll see you know there's far too many homeless people in liverpool and you'll make a, we all make judgments like that mm. but that what we have to remember is that our judgments are frequently wrong you know it takes a long time to get to know people and I don't know this guy in the front of that. You know, I'm briefly stopping and I'm photographing people. And I'm not that keen on, you know, people who come back with comments, you know, like Scully Lab or something like that. Because a lot of these, you know, I'm not sure 
what people would have thought of me had I been photographed at 15. And I've, know, had, I've, had multiple, I've had multiple identities. I'm 46 now. And I've had multiple mm. identities. You know, as you go through each era of your oh. life, you change slightly, don't you? And your look changes and the way you are changes and you develop as, as a person. And, and you know, oh, you, yeah, yeah. you've captured you know, this I... guy in this moment in his life. Who knows what he does now? That, I mean, that's, that's even more interesting, isn't it? Who knows where his life kind of ended up and, and what he did? Yeah, I wouldn't mind finding out, though. So if anybody's got his name there, I yeah. tend to have all the names. You know, like, I know that Joseph was running a cafe. He's now in construction because he's on the internet. So he, I, when I put his photograph up the other day, he got back in contact. And I quite enjoy doing that. And I'm really happy when I find out that, you know, everybody's doing well. And, you know, a few of them are dead now and stuff like that, that were young kids. And I'm always sort of, disappointed when I see people that are younger than me that wound up dying. You know, I've got quite a lot of friends that I went to school with that are dead now, and I'm 58. You know, mm. you know, Thompson drove himself into the harbour. Andrew Taylor killed himself in a car with his children and stuff like that. You know, you get to that sort of middle age thing and you look back on it and you think, God, you know, I know more people probably in the graveyard now than I do actually alive in this town. That's mm. my age. You know, everybody that was older to, than me, my aunties, my uncles, all of the people that I grew up, a lot of the people I grew up with, but a lot of that generation now were vanishing. So, you know, and they were a really peculiar generation because they grew up before there was such a thing as teenagers. Mm. So they had sort of completely different attitudes to life and they grew up you know, quite poor. This is a fishing town. And, you know, the fishing died off years ago. It was declining from the 1920s onwards. So it's a bit like living in a mining village, you know, that you're seeing the last of these miners dying off and everybody else is just working in, you know, retail or they're doing things that this town wasn't actually built or designed for. So, so, so for people who don't know where you are, um, tell us about, you know, your hometown and where you're living now, because, you know, it's quite a, it's quite an outpost in the United Kingdom, isn't it? Wick. It's almost at John O'Groats. It's... Well, yeah, it always has been an outpost, though, because there's only one road up to it, you know, like it. I don't know. I think it was one of the Alexanders once who decided that he was going to build a cathedral in Halkirk, which he did. And, you know, they appointed a bishop to come up type of thing because the locals didn't like them. They just murdered him, you know, which really upset Alexander. So Alexander sent a fleet up with an army to thinking that he was going to get some sort of revenge. You know, if the wind comes from the east, his fleet's going to be smashed and stuff like that. They didn't really kill anybody. They just buggered off back where they came from, you know, because it's such a difficult place to attack because there's no proper harbours. You know, this harbour was built in the 19th century. It was never here. This wet was a little village. It was built in the 19th century, as it is now, as a fishing port after the land clearances. So... You know, people that were kicked off their land either went to Canada or America, wherever. But, you know, everybody that was left wound up getting having to go into fishing, even though they were farmers. You know, people lived on the land type of thing. And it, it is quite a harsh place, and it's always been quite violent, you know, in terms of growing up and stuff like that, because you have personal histories that go back generations in a way, you know, if you didn't get on, it's it's very close. And I, I do actually like that. You know, I had a couple of friends, Stu from Manchester and Derek from down below that didn't come from here and both their parents had, you know, were divorced type of thing and they were up here by themselves and they would never come back. I interviewed... No. I interviewed um... Uh, a guy who lives in 
Shetland. Stuart. <laughs> Stuart, I'm sorry if you're watching this. Your second name has just surpassed me. Um, he lives in uh, Shetland. He's not from Shetland. He's an outsider. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he said that one of the first things he had to get used to as an outsider on Shetland was that when you meet people from Shetland or when they meet each yeah. other, they have to establish what the relationship is first in terms of their position in the community because they've been there for so long and the generations yeah. and generations of people who've, of their family that have lived on the island that there is this internal politics between people who live there. Is that something similar in, in Wick? Oh, of course. You know, like, you know, there's people that I've known since I can't remember when, you know, but there is, there's a kind of connection that will go back, you know, like my next door neighbours, Freddie Tate, his dad died a couple of years ago, his mum's dead now, but I've, Freddie served in the army with my dad in Hong Kong. Freddie was full time, but you know, like, my dad's generation would have all gone to national service together as well. And you know all of their children because you wind up going to school with them. You know, I'd, I've known people up here since I can't remember when I first met them because I've just always known them. You know, it, it's very tightly knit. I'm not sure if I can quite explain what it's like, but, you know, if you came from Kennedy Terrace, well, you've got the McPhee's, You've got the New Orleanses, the Ro Robinsons that were known as the Black Rats next door to my granny and stuff like that. And it's very, it's kind of connected. Like one of the reasons that I like living up here, we were broke for a while, you know, because I I won't sign on or anything like that. And before I was getting prints in, I was working as a driver in the local van delivering newspapers for a while as well but when we didn't have any firewood or anything like that you know all the neighbors would just throw in sort of firewood for me to break up you know there is that sense of a community here as well you know they are they are okay i'm i'm not quite sure what i should be saying about what <laughs> yeah. you know, but yeah. at the same how, how many in Wick are going to be watching this podcast <laughs> um, yeah so, oh, it doesn't matter it can spread it only takes one of my relatives to look at this yeah, there's, not many, on there's not many people for it to go around is that I don't suppose um, okay so moving on from Wick so you left Wick and you came to Liverpool that must have been a culture shock for you was it oh you know? yeah yeah and uh <laughs> Because Liverpool is is a, a very friendly place, you know. It, it's yeah, fun. It's oh, outgoing. Yeah, yeah. It's friendly. People take you in, and you came to Liverpool to be a photographer, and you studied in Wallasey College, mm. and you met Tom Wood, who is a yeah. famous street photographer like yourself, and also Martin Parr is one of my favourite photographers. Amazing British institution of photography. It was a great great you know catch for you to be able to be with those two fantastic photographers like yourself tell us about that relationship because i know people watching this they're going to be really really interested about your tutelage if you like with tom wood and martin parr tell us about that period of of your life well i met tom tom showed up just before christmas and my first year at wallace and he showed up with quite a, a really good portfolio. I remember him going to the interview type of thing and looking at his portfolio afterwards. And I thought it was really good. And he, when he got the job type of thing, I knew quite a bit about my uncle had left me a pile of books. He got me interested in photography. He died when I was 14 or something like that. And I'd inherited these books. So I knew everybody's names which was rather strange for coming from what, you know, I knew who Lee Freelander was. I knew all of the American photographers and that because I had these set of books that I used to sit and read. And we kind of got on quite well. And I started working in Tom's dark room. You know, he would get me to do proofs on a Friday night and stuff like that, you know, when I should have been out having a good time, but I wasn't because I didn't have the money. And I would you know, go around and I would have dinner with him and Lorna and then we would print and go to the pub type of thing. So, you know, 
and I'd stay there when I went to Newport and stuff like that. And it was quite, it was very different from my background, his friends. I remember he had a couple of friends, I won't mention their names and that. And I could be incredibly rude at times. You know, I was just thinking of that the other day. You know, they'd be sitting talking about something and I would just burst out laughing out of the sheer boredom because where I was brought up, everybody speaks at once and we don't actually listen to each other. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> down there, it's like, oh, yes. And they were having this conversation and I swear to God, it was about a white teapot. And it was just a plain white teapot between Lorna his wife and this other woman who was a PR person in a company or something like that. And you know when you get really sort of slightly bored and then you go, oh God, when does And then you go, oh, they, can't, they can't mention this teapot again. And this woman went back and I just wound up in hysterics on the floor. Yeah. You know, I was 19 and really, really bad mannered. And the woman who was speaking about the white teapot was just being polite, you know, to fill in a silence. Whereas I never grew up in a world where people had to fill in silences. They just there had to no shut up yeah. Again. <laughs> yeah. It was like if you got my dad's brothers all in a room, they would all be speaking about something totally different, like different half the time. And nobody would be listening and everybody would be raising their voices to be heard. Mm. And, you know, I thought that was, I still think that was quite wonderful. You know, so uh, tell us about Martin Parr, because that was, um, he was a bit different I, to Tom Wood, because you were very close to Tom Wood when you lived with Tom Wood for a while as well. Yeah, well, I stayed there when I was at college, and I, I do have a, what you may call it, a mention in his first book for showing up every time it was dinner time. You know, I would just sort of knock on their door type of thing, see what's for dinner. Mm. Right, okay. But I was used to doing that up here because I would eat in other people's houses as well. But yeah, Martin, I didn't really know very well. I used to show up on a Sunday afternoon and I would take photographs with him and Tom, you know, when they were hanging around taking photographs. Yeah. I think that Martin thought I was a bit of a pain in the ass. You know, he looked at me funny a few times going, what the hell are you doing hanging around? You know, because you're trying to get space for yourself to work. You've already found that Tom's already there and then you get some spotty. <laughs> but Tom did actually arrange for me to go around to his house one night, you know, to see his work. And I, at the time, I really liked the Irish work that he did. I still like a lot of that early black and white stuff that he did do. I like the colour stuff as well. But, mm. you know, at that time, I was more familiar. and I remember saying to him, you know, stick to the black and white. <laughs> but was, was, that was a big thing, wasn't it? Was the transition of a specifically um, documentary photography, which traditionally was black and white and yeah. colour. There was a bit of a scandal about the transition from black and white to colour for documentary photography. And it was it was looked I, down I think, upon. I think it was particularly. See, I remember Martin coming to Newport when I was a student there. And Newport was quite middle class. You know, mm. I was one of very few people who actually got a grant from the, you know, they would accept 20 photographers from all around the world. There wasn't very many guys from working class estates and work. There were, you know, they did try to be fair and stuff like that, but mm. there was still quite a lot. And I found out like the class seemed to be not criticizing his work, but seemed to be criticizing him for being middle class and photographing working class people, which I thought was just silly anyway. But yeah, you know, and I, I thought also a lot of people were getting a bit jealous about his success, you know, mm. because he then becoming successful after shooting the New Brighton work. And then you get in, into these questions about exploitation. You know, naturally, if you're photographing somebody and you're earning a living out of it, you could see it as being exploitation. I, I always thought it was like an interest. I didn't really know the history of it, but I always thought it was an interesting coincidence that because I was. Um, you know, always been into photography and I used to be a music video director and made quite a lot of music videos and photography was one of my touchstones for inspiration and uh, Martin Parr's work, The Last Resort, which I really love. And I know that he did, he was famous for his New Brighton work. And then I found yeah. out that Tom Wood had done New Brighton. And then I found out that you had done New Brighton. And I thought, what's the coincidence here that, that New Brighton was this, you know, um, this... Um, 
place where all these amazing photographers wanted to go. But then I found out recently it's because you all live together at the same time, at the same place. And, you know, yeah. you're, all, you're all inspired off was, each other. Well, there wasn't that many documentary photographers around then. You know, I was just a student. It was just Tom Wood. There's Tom Wood. There's Martin Parr, Chris Keller, Graham Smith. We have only a handful of proper documentary photographers that because there's no way of making a living out of it. Yeah. It, you know, you won't get any money for wandering around Liverpool sort of thinking, well, I think this is interesting rather than unless you're commissioned to do a job. And every time you're commissioned to a job, do a job, it's going to be some guy in a suit or somebody that wants their photograph in a newspaper. Mm. So it's always public relations in some form or another. You know, you're photographing something because somebody wants publicity for it rather mm. than what is actually happening or what's real. You know, nobody's going to commission you to, I don't know, photograph an Af average street or a pile of teenagers just hanging around in the corner. It's part of a poverty story or... How lucky we were to have three great photographers all at that moment mm. in time, actually capturing uh, oh. Liverpool and, you know, the UK at I large. I was nowhere near as good as either Tom or Martin. I think you're pretty you awesome. Let's have a look at the next photograph. Mm. So you, so you fr from this platform, you went on to just start taking photographs in, in Liverpool. And uh, I didn't this do one, that. Yeah. This one oh, that's is amazing. Johnny Crummy and I think, he used to work in Cameliers. I don't know these people. I only ever met them once for a few seconds and they were nice enough to stop for me as a student. When I went up to them and said, excuse me, can I take your photograph? I'm a student and I'm doing a project for my course. And both of them were nice enough to stop with for me. So at the time, I didn't know their names. I started these photographs were things that I'd had for about 30 years and they'd basically laying in a file that had never been printed. That's amazing. That really is amazing. Yeah, a treasure trove that was just waiting for uh, time to yeah. catch up. But it wasn't really a case of time waiting to trap up because I had a Facebook page with about 100 people on it, most of them that I didn't know. Hmm. And somebody else came on, I, I forget his name now, and said, well, you should send a few photographs, you know, to the community. It was a Facebook community page that was run by Christine. And as soon as I put the work onto there, you know, the response was absolutely phenomenal, you mm -hmm. know, because this was actually their childhoods. And it was them that gave me everybody's names. I didn't remember names, you know, after 30 years or anything like that. And that's when it started to become interesting for me. Well, it was my okay. childhood too. This is where I this is where I grew up yeah. in the nineteen eighties and the nineteen nineties, and these are all my memories. And you know, I remember the bombed out buildings that hadn't been demolished yet, where we used to play. Yeah. I remember Quick Save. <laughs> Quick Save was like ubiquitous at the time. You know, where it was like as ubiquitous as as the or Tesco is today. It was a a budget shopping center, or maybe oh, more like no. Aldi. <laughs> yeah. Do you know yeah. what happened to me as well? That the guys whose family owned Quick Saves yeah. got in contact with me and they wanted a plastic bag. They didn't want one of my photographs. They just wanted to know if I had a plastic bag so wow. they could put it on their wall. And I Amazing. thought, you know, I was so impressed with the owners of mm. Quick Save getting they in Welsh? contact with me. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. They, it was just text messaging. They were yeah. asking, but I have a friend called Cory a Bagman, who collect, who's a rubbish collector in Hull. He works for the <laughs> bins, and he collects bags. So I gave them his address and said, oh, he'll have a few, because, you know, Amazing. he'll do things. I think that he also goes into houses, houses and clears them after people die. Mm. So mm. he finds, and he collects plastic bags which I think is quite interesting because you never ever think of a plastic bag until you see it and you go, God, mm. not seen that for, you know, 30 years. And well, all safe. these objects, these objects are like touchstones, aren't they, for memories and oh, yeah, ability yeah. to travel back in time and think about these things that are so important to our own lives. And like you say, your work is called The Dash Between and yeah. it's about birth and death 
and that dash between which is our life. Yeah. And that's why this nostalgia, if you like, is so important to us, especially as oh. those involved in the dash that are at the middle of the dash <laughs> or more towards yeah. the end of the dash. You know, we're looking yeah, back you and, do. and trying to get our that's memories. one of the problems with this interview is that you're asking me questions and I'm going, well, I didn't really feel like that at 20. Yeah. You know what I mean? These, to me, were people that were helping me and my career. They weren't, they were originally meant for an exhibition that never came off. But, you know, I, I've always felt that they were helping me. And it's a kind of collaboration when you stop somebody and say, excuse me, can I take your photograph? It's them that make the photograph if you're doing a portrait. You know, the portrait is good because of Johnny Crummy. It's all I've done is choose a background or said, well, I'll take that there. Mm. And I have to do it really quickly. But I do think that the photographs are good because the subjects are strong. Yeah. And, you know, you can say things to them like, don't smile, and they won't smile. You try saying that to a politician, fuck mm. off. You know, it's like, well, this photograph is... You know, they get used to being photographed for local newspapers, pointing at things. I remember doing it to, I think it was Malcolm Rifkind once. Try, I was doing a job for Inside Housing. And everywhere he went, I was supposed to be trying to get a serious photograph of him, and he was pointing at everything. And I kept on saying, well, why are you pointing at things? And he went, but isn't that what you want? Because that's what his local newspaper had always wanted. You get that all the time. Mm. And that's one of the reasons that I'd actually... You know, I've really enjoyed doing that, and I'd love to go back to finish the project. You know, Liverpool Museum want to do an exhibition of it, and they want to do some of the stuff with the peer, with Pure Head as well. And it'd be really interesting because I'm in contact with a lot of people, so I could rephotograph them again as well, and then rephotograph the area and the buildings because that buildings may seem as though they're going to be there forever but they're going to have to upgrade them and everything within 50 years of them being built. I think the lifespan's about 50 or 60 years. You know, I don't think that they'll pull them down as they did with the tear blocks and everything like that, but it'd be worth having a record for future generations because as we feel about our youth, you know, the youth that are there now will feel the same way when they grow up because Liverpool's always changed and it will always change. You know, nothing stays the same, unfortunately, with a lot of things. But the world's moved on now since I was 23 and I shot these. And, you know, I'd love to go back and sort of meet everybody. I was back for half a day because the Scotty Press wanted to do an interview. I was doing a job in Manchester and I came through and it's like, you know, I walked down to the place, can't remember the guy's name just now. But, you know, one of the cleaners came up and went, oh, you're the guy that photographed me outside here. And I was trying to take her photographs. And, no, I'm old and ugly now. And you just go, aren't we all? Mm -hmm. you, you say it's an unfinished project, but is a project like this ever finished? Is it just an oh, ongoing, no, no. open, you know? Yeah, but it would be nice in this day and age, even if I went back and trained another few people, you know, because we're living at a period in history that... I couldn't carry on shooting in colour because of the sheer cost of doing that. You know, like Tom and Martin were lecturers. They had an income in Tom's teaching, but, you know, Tom could go out and shoot 15, 20 rolls of colour film in a day, which you can imagine how much that costs. That's, you know, not far off a hundred and odd pounds a day just on film and getting it processed. And now we live in a digital age. There's no reason at all why we can leave a record behind the, you know, for future generations and historians of of Liverpool. And you could literally photograph everybody in that city now that would have cost hundreds of thousands of pounds a generation ago. And I, I think it's worthwhile leaving that because Liverpool's really being transformed at the moment and it is changing so much that you know, you could have that and you could commission people to come in like long after I'm dead and build up an archive of what it was like to live in Liverpool. And I don't just mean in terms of still photography. You know, you could capture all of that, a lot of the pubs and stuff like that that are vanishing, you know, as people's habits and stuff like that change. And, you know, I, I just think it'd be an interesting thing to do.
and it'd be interesting for other generations long like right now we're doing nostalgia but in 30 or 40 years time we're all just going to be history none of us are going to be around isn't documentary uh, photography or any kind of documentary doesn't it really start to have weight and importance as, as time goes on and, and we're able to look at it through the lens of of history is that what documentary film making and photography oh, yeah. is about and is that th why it's important yeah I, I do think it's it's important that we leave behind our history so you know like yeah generation yeah. after generation that has lived in Liverpool you know it's over a thousand years old or whatever and then sometimes when you're sitting in a pub you know how they've got old photographs there you realize how hard Liverpool would have been to live in in the 19th century or the 20th century because there was such a lot of poverty and that's kind of improving now as well but I think it can be quite handy to look at somebody you know a photograph of somebody that's already gone through you know a lot of the things that you've gone through in your life as well we all have hard times and mm. whatever and I think it's worth having a record of Liverpool. Liverpool is a shared experience that goes back maybe, you know, a thousand years. Mm. And there have been a lot of bad times. And I just find it interesting passing on things to other people that have yet to be born. That's as well as that, you can come back and say, this is your great, great granny or whatever. And be, there would be a photograph in the local museum. So if you were doing your family history, because people may be taking photographs just now, but how many of them will actually be kept, filed, you know, and be around in a hundred years time? If you can get them into a museum, then they become a part of the history of Liverpool. You know, it may only be a very small part of that history, but I think it's worth doing. Let's have a look at the next photo. Um, this one is so cool. And I know Joe, that's Joe Ainsco, isn't it, in, in the back? That's Joe there. That's Melanie. I once had a guy contact me to say, oh, I've just seen Melanie in the shop. And I was going, you know, is this some sort of spy thing? Poor women can't even go to the shop, but she's the person in this photograph. <laughs> but I've got everybody's name from it. You know, I've got a book here. With You've done a few minute. with Joe, though. I've seen, I went through, obviously, as many yeah. of your photographs as I could, and well, I noticed first... Joe popped up quite a few times. Yeah, well, that was only one roll of film. It was the first one I did, and practically every frame on it was really quite good. Uh... It's the best roll of film I'd ever shot in my life. <laughs> you know, but they were such good kids. You know, like... I've told them not to smile there, and then I'm asking, I can't remember the guy in the middle's name just now, you know, to get Melanie to look at, into the camera lens, and she doesn't want to. <laughs> so he's wrapping her head around saying, look into the camera. So was that one of your that things, was Rob? Was that one of your things, was to have your subjects not to smile? Was that your main yeah. direction to your, to your well, uh, subjects? I didn't want them to look like snapshots. You know, mm. they're supposed to be documents of an age and not. And, you know, if you walk down the street and you see somebody that's smiling, especially if you see them smiling all the time, you do think they're a bit loose in the head. I mm. do anyway. Mm. You know, smiling's not something natural. It's just something that somebody will do for you because you've asked them to take if you can take their photograph and maybe because you're a complete stranger you know they want to seem nice which you know i think you're nice anyway the second you say oh yeah don't mind so you will you do tend to get that but sometimes it works you know like there's a woman now that's not in the boat or anything that died and Every time I saw her, you know, I, I photographed the market for a bit afterwards and I would bump into her and I'd bump and she was always smiling. You know, I asked her not to smile and she's got this look on her face that I'm going, it's just not quite right. So I always use the smiley one every time I get her but up. But what I notice as well is that there's a lot of them that have a wry smile. It's like you've told them not to smile, but there is like a very subtle 
smile beneath that gives them this ambiguity and, 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 and uh, it makes them yeah. enigmatic. Like, like, look at the guy, the kid in the middle picture there. He's not smiling, but but he is. <laughs> There's like a real oh, yeah, yeah, smile it's... underneath, isn't yeah, there? You yeah. know, you can see it coming through. But... I don't mind. I don't mind that. No, you know, that's I perfect. That's well, great. Yeah, it yeah. Makes, well, it makes them look human. Yeah. It's just sometimes when the smile is really false. There's too many photographs in this world with false smiles. Mm. You know, mm. I know because I photographed a few politicians in my time, mm. and you know, it's just a part of the pose. And I'm not very keen on it, really. It just makes them look like snapshots where know, was this people. taken rob do you remember i think it's world Wal- 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 walton Wal- walton Street. no it's kirkdale kirkdale okay yeah i'd wandered up because i couldn't i couldn't find anybody so joe became a professional no. boxer and yeah he now has his own podcast his own boxing podcast Oh, yeah. that's good. Because so I'll send him this. Wants... I'll send him this when we publish it, and you might even be in touch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I did once. He was on the Sky TV thing. They'd phone me up because they wanted to use a few photographs. So I gave them, I gave them his address because they wanted to talk about you know growing up in Liverpool. So he did the interview. They were quite happy with his interview. I never saw it because I don't get Sky TV. Yeah, cool. But now he comes across. He's working in construction now. He did have a cafe for a while but he just said when he was on the internet the other day that it had folded but it was the worst time ever to start up a cafe you know just before covid hit yeah so that wouldn't have been very easy for him but i do believe that most of them melanie's got children you know most of them will have children now and be middle-aged men Mm -hmm. and you know i will actually get around to re-photographing joseph one day again but I'm round about the spoken. same age. I'm round about the same age as Joe, and I was, yeah. you know, I, this is this is where I grew up. I grew up in Anfield, from the age of oh god, two till about Both. the age of ten, eleven, and then I moved to Kirby. But yeah, this is just how I remember. I had that Adidas tracksuit top. I remember it. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, really good, really cool. Yeah, um, I didn't know anything about clothes or anything because. I'd worked from the age of 13 onwards, so I just went out and bought clothes and stuff like that. But everybody else seems to remember, you know, this crack suit top that they had when they were yeah. 13 or 14. But they would have had to have pestered their mums for it. Well, in Liverpool, tracksuits were the thing. You know, you, you grew up and you had tracksuits, and mm. every Christmas you'd get new Christmas clothes, and they would include a tracksuit, a, a new pair of trainers, and it would also be an Easter at Easter, you would get a new mm. set of clothes as well. And what we would do in Liverpool, we would all, all go to Southport Fair in our new clothes for Easter. That would be like a, mm. a bit of a tradition. And yeah, Adidas tracksuits were the one. That was the one. Cool. Hey, just a reminder, as you know, those engaged in the struggle for truth and justice face an uphill struggle against the soy boy censors at YouTube who continue to suppress this channel and prevent the truth from reaching you. So by clicking the subscribe button below, you're giving the middle finger to YouTube by supporting independent content creators like me. So if you've got what it takes, subscribe today. Now back to the action. So. I went, I had a job when I was 13. I got a job as a porter in the local hotel and I yeah. actually wound up getting paid because I was getting something like £10 a bus in, £10 a bus out, and I was getting a pound fifty an hour, which was a lot of money in 1976, 77. Mm. So I had quite a good childhood and I didn't have to beg off my mum for anything. I just went out and bought my own clothes. But saying that, they were nice enough never to take any money off me. Went to the mention quite a lot as well. Um, This next one for me is just an amazing photograph. So it's so potent. And that's one of the things I really love about your photographs is that you capture not just one age, you capture two ages. It's used all of these women, these older women who have headscarves and the long coats and the long max, right? They are a, a like a hangover from another age, like pre-war, you know, and they're the, the last remnant of, of that pre-war um, kind of culture. She's not pre-war. She is the war. She, she is, is the war. Actually, <laughs> yeah. Her name is Laura Losh. Her, peri- her daughter got in contact with me. She used to be in the Italian Renaissance resistance during the war wow so she's not actually from liverpool and the reason that she's actually in liverpool is that she helped three british prisoners 
a war escape from the Nazis and she married one of them and moved to Liverpool. Wow, that's incredible. So, you know, she is an incredible woman. You know, I'm not sure. I You sometimes watch these things on TV and think, you know, I would have probably ran a mile. Mm -hmm. But, so, you know, she had history. What was her name? Laura Lolsch. Laura Lolsch. And what's this? Is this like a second-hand charity shop? Yeah, it's shop, a second-hand kind of? shop in Everton. Yeah. I remember those tea chests. See the tea chests? Mm. We had them yeah, in our yeah. house. You don't see many of them anymore. You don't see any of them anymore. That, that well, doesn't... people don't import tea like that. But there would have been loads of them around Liverpool because tea would have been imported. And we they used would to have, have them in, in our house. Spot. I remember them having at least one in our house, that tea chest. Yeah. There, the, my well, toys that's might one's got Felix Stowe on it, hasn't it? So, it has, yeah. you know, it's came in like that. And I'm sure Liverpool would have been, you know, it would have been like sugar in that. I'm not sure that would have came in sacks. Mm. But, you know, now everything's just boxed and it's put into a container. Yeah. Ready to go into the shocks. But but you yeah, know. but just back for a moment, just back to that what we just um, touched on there, which is the the two eras. It might be better in another photograph that we can pick it up. But it's like you had the whole um, pre-war culture, the industrial culture, if you like, which is probably a hundred years old or more, which was the same thing pretty much, and and the culture didn't change much. But post-war, with the introduction of uh, TV and music and all those oh. things and fashion, everything began to change really, really quickly. And we mm. see that in your photographs, the how the, the, the youth and the fashions change so much, but yet the older generation... Of the flat the, caps. The and flat the, caps, the, the yeah. suit and tie, you know, and the older women with the headscarves. I mean, what women wear headscarves now? You know, that, yeah, that's but remember gone. as well that the headscarves were things that you got off Hollywood movies and a headscarf was the only thing that you could really afford that was going to be fashionable and mm. stuff like that. So in a way, what we were doing is looking at people as I am looked at now, you know, in my, at the age of 58, like people, I grew up watching maybe, you know, uh, the Three Stooges or, you know, black and white movies on TV mm. when I was a kid and now they're watching Back to the Future or Star Wars. It's the same thing, isn't it? That, you know, there's a kind of gap and it's like, I don't wear trainers or if I go out and all the 13 year olds around here are all wearing, you know, uh, what's the name? The one with the tech, Nike. Nike's really big up here and that's mm. what they all wear. You know, it's just a thing that changes to me. And I do know that that generation were brought up differently. You dressed like your father. Well, this one here, this one here yeah. re reminds me of my granddad on my father's side. Mm. This is how he looked. And they had that quiffed hair, you know, that quiffed hair that they yeah. all use brill cream to keep back and slick back hair, which was which was the hairstyle. You know, I, yeah, I I'm look, not sure if that's more 1950s. Though. I 1950s, yeah, back. but it was, it was a hangover yeah. from the 50s. It was a cultural hangover, you know, like a teddy boy. Yeah. Yeah, you could always tell sort of working class people on a Saturday afternoon because they wore a suit. You got uh, to that stage uh, where people who actually worked in offices and had to wear a suit all week would wear jeans. You know, that uh, sort of turn off from the sex days type of thing. Yeah. yeah, my dad always wore a suit that was always cheaply made. He didn't really understand that, you know, having a nylon suit wasn't the same as having a pure woolen suit. Mm -hmm. But see, but, you've, yeah. caught, you've caught his expression as well, haven't you? Did you, would you have taken multiple shots of this guy and you selected the one that you like the most? Because that's the difference, isn't it? For people who take photographs now, they use digital cameras and they can take hundreds of pictures oh, yeah. of, of the subject and have the luxury of just taking your time to pick one. But when you were using film, you had 30 shots. And if, you know, you-, you I had 12. 12 shots, so you had to one, um, have the camera under your control. Two, have uh, your shot set up as best you can. And three, you know, you had to capture the moment without having a hundred digital uh, opportunities to do so. I had two frames. I didn't have enough money for buying film. It was too expensive. So I, the only one that I ever shot 12 frames of was the one with uh, Joseph in it. Mm. You know, that group with Joseph. All these are just two frames. 
two three frames. frames at the most. I would just say, excuse me, can I take your photograph? And I would literally do them within a few seconds. You know, it just happened that that dog was there. You know, I may say <laughs> move a bit till I find a bit better background. It looks like I the also... dog's posing as well as in this shot. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that's what I was that's what I was doing. I was just taking photographs within, you know, if I stop you in the street, I won't hold, I won't take up much of your time. I'll say, excuse me, can I take your photograph? And then I'll take your photograph. Would, you, would you tell them that you were a, a photographer? Was that this was part of a project? I would say that. How I'm would you approach, what, was, what would be your approach in getting, getting people to agree to be your subject? Just saying, would you mind if I take your photograph? Um, mm a student at college and I'm doing a project and people would stop for me. Yeah. You know, people will stop for you and they will take the time. And sometimes when you're working candidly, if you hang around, you eventually get to know everyone. You know, the work that I did in Pure Head and that, most of the people were actually friends of mine. Mm. By the end of that, I was unemployed at the time and I had these tins of film that I used to buy off Tom for nine pounds a can. And I would just hang out in the cafe the same as anyone else because I didn't really have anywhere else to go, <laughs> you know, and I used to just photograph and I would speak to Peter or Aggie and, you know, have cups of tea with them and just hang around and fo take photographs. Mm. You know, it, it seemed, in fact, it became perfectly normal for them as well, that they'd just be this guy hanging around taking photographs. Mm. And I enjoyed it as well. You know, a lot of them were retired and old and you know they may not have looked that well dressed and that but a lot of them were actually quite interesting and again a lot of the older people were born at the turn of the last century well look at this guy i mean this this could be something from a victorian age if that was black and white that that could easily be something from a victorian yeah. age and look at it it's just an incredible photograph that do you know much that, about the guy his or, granddaughter because his granddaughter was back in contact i've got their names as well obviously he's dead now yeah but you know these sort of sheepskin coats or whatever they were were quite <laughs> fashionable for a while and it's probably a cold day mm. So, but look at the baby's he, cheeks. The baby's cheeks tell you it's a cold day, doesn't it? Yeah, she's got big, yeah. red, rosy cheeks. Yeah, and she doesn't look too happy at this stranger who's <laughs> just popped up saying, excuse me, can I take your photograph? Well, to her granddad. Yeah. I'm not even sure if he wants his photograph taken because I've got a close-up of her and I've got two of him. And I think he thought I was going to photograph just the baby, but she was crying too much. <laughs> mm. you know, Do you know where this was? And... Do you know where this it, was? It's the top of Ever Everton Brow, that street that goes along there. You know, like there's a library in the top. County corner, Road. And then you go down a street and it's the one that comes along the top. C County Road. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's County Road. I think it could be County Road because that goes on. But if you go down one, you go down the streets from County Road, it's the mm. one at the bottom of there. I remember buildings like that when I was growing up. You know, they were. Oh, it's full because none bomb. of these corner shops were making very much money with, you know, like all of these stores had opened up, like yeah. quick saves and corner stores were always quite expensive. I photographed a couple of Asian stores just down from there mm. and they were both still running at the time. I don't mm. think they're they're in business anymore. You know, it that corner a, shops are becoming a thing of the past. It, it was a tough time in Liverpool in the 80s. It was tough for the population. I mean, oh, yeah. a lot of the people didn't know any different, so it was just, you know, a daily occurrence that you just had to get on with. But it was, uh, you know, it was a poor city. It was deprived. It had a government under the Thatcher regime that had no sympathy or tolerance for... Well, Liverpool and you know you had the whole Derek Hatton era who was trying to push back against Thatcher maybe you know and, and that came back to uh, haunt Liverpool to, to some degree because Thatcher made an example of uh, Liverpool's resistance or rebellion and it became last in the list of northern towns to be redeveloped. Manchester was first and then off they went to Leeds and Sheffield and Newcastle and eventually Eventually, they made it back round to, to Liverpool. Um, but well, then that protest thing has always been a part of Liverpool's history, hasn't it? You know, like yeah. the Dockers' strike of 1911 and you name it. You know, Liverpool will stand up for its rights. And I think that's quite a good 
thing. You know, mm. I quite like the fact that they were militant and they were the main complainers. Out of all of Britain then, you would see Liverpool would stand up and say, hey, this is fucking wrong, basically. Mm. You know, she was closing businesses and industries left, right and centre and thrown. I remember being unemployed in Wallace at the time. I was living in New Brighton and I had to go to a restart course whilst I was photographing. And it was me and all of these guys that had worked at Bidston Steel. And we walked into this course and it was like the women looked at them and went, now you've got an interview, what's the first thing that you do? And one of them said, well, we get out of bed. And she went, no, you don't do that. You set your alarm clock. You know, to a pile of middle-aged men that had been working their entire lives, mm. telling them to start. And it was just, like, ludicrous. It's a humiliation ritual, isn't it? You know, especially oh, to well, men. Of course. That's why yeah. I won't sign on. I will starve before I have these <laughs> decks telling me what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, yeah. quite literally, you know, I've been around food bins and the back of the co-op up here because there's been no food. And I just go... No chance. I'll find myself a job. You know, just now I sell a couple of prints on the internet, you know, through the British Cultural Archive. Brilliant. I get very... Yeah, is that, is that the know, one on Instagram, is it? The the page on Instagram? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely oh. fantastic channel, that, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. Well, it's, again, sort of a lot of the photographs are by amateurs as well, and it's interesting to see it. And Paul's really interested in popular culture through the ages. Mm. And it's interesting It's interesting that these sites exist now that wouldn't have been there sort of 10, 15 years ago. So you can actually share. It's the democratisation of photography in some way. Because it gives mm. you an exhibition space that would, like we discussed earlier, which oh, yeah. is normally, you know, only for those who have been anointed by the system, they get to exhibit their work, and therefore it's controlled to a large degree, isn't well, it? Whereas you've now got a free platform to put what you want up. Well, the problem with it as well is that if you want to work with a gallery, you have to fill in all these forms, yep. and they're quite pretentious. I had a look, and I just couldn't fill them in. You know, they were asking me questions that one aren't didn't think had anything to do with what i did you know it's almost as though they're controlling the questions and you have to ask answer in a way that they think is appropriate or you know i, I just gave up you know i had one look at it that was the reason that i went to see liverpool museum and that because i was hoping to do an exhibition and you know they were fine they wanted to do both of them and then I found well I just couldn't raise the finance because I am not I don't really class myself as an artist and I certainly don't write or you know an artist statement to me is you know a really embarrassing well, you talk through your images, don't you? That's then, the way you communicate yeah. with people. Is, is Yeah, but they're not interested in that. They're only yeah. interested in actually what you write. You know, you're basically supposed to run courses for, you know, t teenage children and pensioners, basically, because I've photographed quite a lot of them. And I, I don't really want to teach, mm. neither. I'm not very good at it, as you can see just now. I'm, I'd be much happier out taking <laughs> photographs than doing this. It's just stuff that I don't think about. If I was in Liverpool, it was all I would do is kick myself out of bed, have a couple of cups of tea, hang around for an hour, get bored, go out and ask some people if I, you know, go to Everton and ask some people if I could take the photographs. What kind of cameras did you use? What was your um, weapon of choice? Oh, my weapon of choice was a borrowed camera from Newport, a Bronica with a 80 millimeter lens. That's what I used in Everton and stuff like that. I actually went. I was a, just one in lens. With a few doctors once and I left it in a pub. I got rather smashed one Friday afternoon whilst they all got paid because they kept on buying me drinks. And I think I wound up getting in a taxi, then putting me in a taxi to put me back to Tom's. And I woke up in the morning and I didn't have the cameras. I had a camera and two lenses, but when I went back the next day, they'd left it behind the bar for me. And the barman just said, ah, you forgot this. You know, 
Mm. Which was good, you know, the camera even, cameras and the few lenses would have been worth over a thousand pounds then. So I would have been in real trouble had I gone back and said, well, well, I wouldn't have said that I'd gone pissed. Well, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Otherwise they would have charged me for the thousand pounds. But you you don't seem happy. like the type of photographer that is really concerned with kit, that you, you just want to go out oh, no. into the field and, and, and capture the moment and regardless of whatever kit you've got. But you, know? you have to have the right kit to do the job. One of the reasons that I'm here is that I need to get a medium for, format digital camera because that's the only thing that will do the job. I care about it in terms of the quality. Yeah. You know, if you don't have the right equipment to do the job, I'm interested in the camera and the lens, but I'm not interested in lighting or flash guns or any of that sort of thing. So what kind I'm of camera only... are, you trying, are you trying to get? What, what lenses do, would you... Uh... You desire oh, well, I need to get a Fujifilm medium format camera GFX, either you know, one of the modern ones or a second hand one because that's medium format and that'll give me the color saturation and the quality that I'll need. You know, if I'm going to be stopping people in the street, I don't want to be taking photographs that I know are going to be bad mm. before I even bother downloading them. These small cameras, I've got one here. Oops. Well, you, meant, had, you had one. <laughs> yeah, well, these are just meant for taking snap. You know, people that are doing things, candid work when they aren't posing. If you do portraits or landscapes, you really need to be using, you know, um, a medium format camera. Even now in digital, I think that you do. That's my personal opinion anyway. Mm. And the color saturation and everything's better than you get out of these things. And as well as that, people treat you more seriously. If you've got a camera on a tripod and you ask somebody to take their photograph, they'll take it more seriously and they will do as you tell them. If you walk up with one of these things, it's all they're going to do is smile at you yeah, and sort of stand there. And that doesn't work as a photograph. Because that's, that's what I thought, you know, when you said you walked up to your subjects and said, do you mind if I take your photograph? Was, was you armed with, you know, two cameras, one over your shoulder and, did you look the part? Because back then, you know, in the 1980s and the 1990s, digital cameras were, were non-existent. And having a camera was still a bulky affair, wasn't it? You looked like you were a serious oh, yeah. player if you had a camera. I had one on the tripod with an 80mm lens. I also had a 35mm that I used to take the light read in for because the bigger one didn't have a light meter yeah. in it. But yeah, I'm sure that that sort of affected it as well. And I may consider, even though I don't need a tripod anymore, I still got a tripod. Mm. And I would probably still walk around town with the tripod just because people's reactions to me are different. Mm. You know, they take it more seriously and not a, not as a snapshot type of thing. Yeah. I don't know why that is. I remember David Bailey saying something about that as well, is that people's reaction, if you use a 5.4 camera... And you have to put the head under it and look up at them type of thing. Because I think people more serious. Because I think people feel as if they are being recorded for prosperity rather than someone's prosperity or prosperity. Prosperity rather than people being, you know, in someone's yeah. iPhone archive. I think yeah. the kit gives the impression, doesn't it, that this is serious, I'll take it serious. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and I'm sure that people did because I didn't have very many problems with, you know, saying, don't smile. Yeah. You know, and that was something that I automatically did to everyone. Well, let's have and a look at this next one. You tell anybody that didn't pay any attention to me because they're smiling. Let's have a look at this next one because that, I think that one sums up what you're saying. This is probably one of your most iconic images that we know. And oh. who, who is it in the, in the shot? The mother is called Peggy. Her daughter is still alive. Is that her daughter on the left? Yeah, the daughter's on the left and the mother's on the right, Peggy. Ah, uh, yeah, Margaret Flemingham and her mother, Peggy. They're from Wilsley Street in Kirkdale. So I mean, the, her daughter's still alive, but her mother is dead. It's, it's like, you know, the enigmatic smile we spoke of earlier. The, the, yeah. the daughter on the left, she appears, to me at least, looking at her, to have that enigmatic smile. There seems to be something coming through and her eyes, they're so... Uh, they're so penetrating. It's such a brilliant image. And the colours, yeah. you know, the headscarves match the back. It's great. Yeah, no, they were both quite nice. I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if I've spoken to Margaret or not. I don't think I have, actually, but people have spoken 
her behalf. Do you remember these taking these shots? I'm not very sure because I live with I've had them in contact sheets for ages, so they tend to be an aid to memory. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, every now and again I look at them and then you can remember it. And it's amazing how you can actually remember situations and places that you've been because you photographed it all. You know, I've mm-hmm. got photographs from India and Romania, Romania and stuff like that, and I remember everybody in them in a way that I wouldn't remember them had I not been taking photographs. Mm. You know, even from people up here, I no longer remember their names. But I can remember much better if I've got a photograph in front of me. I can remember the instant that I was there. You know, it was, there was one known by Slinger Tech that I'd photographed. He was a famous character in Everton at the time. And I only met him briefly. And I've got two photographs of him. One when he's looking at me with a big smile on his face, it doesn't work. And the next second, because kids just to call him names you know i think slinger tet was one of them but i don't remember his name anymore but he looked around and then he went chasing down the road after this kid mm-hmm. and it was like when somebody sort of got on saying that he'd always used to chase us for calling us names you know i suddenly remembered and i looked at the contact sheet and i went oh that's why i remember that now that he'd looked around and I remembered somebody shouting something because he was an interesting character. Mm. And most people say he was an incredibly nice man as well. Yeah, you know, it's it just was... kids pulling the piss and he should have ignored them. But see, these two these two ladies here, I mean, they don't look like they're from the 1980s, do they? They look like they're from the 1930s or the 1940s, yeah. you know? Well, I think Margaret's dressing older than she actually is. Maybe yeah. it's she's only, but she could have had her hair done. They've both had their hair done, so they may be going out that night. Because you know, the she's curlers. Got roll, she got the curlers in, the yeah. rollers in, hasn't I, she? Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was a Saturday afternoon. Well, it's what's funny is that now mm. you still see women in Liverpool wear rollers. Yeah, they'll go yeah. out with the with the hairs in, in rollers because they're trying to bake the hair for so long for 24 hours that they go out shopping with the rollers and people think it's crazy but look you know you can you can at least trace it back to this photograph in which they've mm. gone out with the rollers rollers here oh people in liverpool have been doing that probably since victorian times yeah forever it's perfectly you know from the day rollers were invented mm. you know you put on your head scarf do your shop and because you couldn't stay all the saturday afternoon then anyway mm. You would have to go to the shops because normally the shops then would have closed on a Sunday. The See, supermarket the, definitely would have been closed. It wasn't for, until John Major came in that Sunday opening yeah. happened, and that was the 90s. For me, the mother looks a lot happier than the daughter. The daughter has a real pained expression on her face in this shot. Yeah, but sometimes you also have to remember as well that there is a complete stranger here taking a photograph of you. Yeah. You know, and I sometimes look at their eyes and I sometimes think, you're wondering what the hell I'm doing. Mm. <laughs> you know, you're being very polite and allowing me to take your photograph, but it's all I'm really saying is, you know, I'm a student or, you know, I'm taking a photograph for a particular reason. But, the, know, art, some... but the art of photography, at least in, in this sense is the selection process the edit because how many images did you take in order to make your selections and when it's the selections then it's down to you your your projection isn't it why are you choosing this shot over another shot i'm generally choosing it because i think it's a better shot the background's better they're not smiling in it there's just very easy, simple, simple decisions that I'm making, that the light's all right. They're, they tend to be technical decisions. Mm. You know, if it's sunny, I will always walk down the side of the street that isn't exposed to sunlight. You know, I'll walk in the shadows because I know that the light's better over there mm. because otherwise the face is going to be really full of harsh shadows. And these... To me, they're just technical, you know, like choosing a background. You know, I'll be aware of a street where there's decent backgrounds and I may choose to stop a person just as they come to the background that I like so they'll fit into that. But to me, that's just technical considerations. But that's you know, that's people... really where the art is, though, for you, isn't it? Is the selection. You know, is, is whittling, it, whittling it down to what you think is the 
uh, is the oh, best yeah, for yeah. photographs. Yeah, but I think that that decisions are very sim simple to make. You know, mm. anyone can learn how to do that. Mm. You know, it's the people for me that make the photographs, and that's what makes the photographs interesting. You know, had I chosen to go to a really boring area like South Liverpool, I don't think the people would have been half as interested, and most of them wouldn't have stopped for me in the first place. What do you mean, like Wilson and Allison and those places? Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> where you don't see anybody around anyway, and they all seem to have big gardens and cars, mm. and you never see anybody on the bloody well streets around that place. And if they do, well, you know, it's only to pop out. You, I'm, I'm not that keen on South Liverpool very much. <laughs> we used to live in just off Lark Lane, and I remember going to Keith's once. Yeah. Once. Yeah. And just looking at it, going, oh, for I never went back. I went to Peter Cavanagh's. I used to just walk down Princess Avenue. Well, it's even more gentrified than it used to be uh, Lark Lane now. They've, they've half pedestrianised it as well. So. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I've, I've been down since then. They've changed every restaurant as well. Yeah. You know, Obviously, the rents have increased, and yeah, it's even more of at least where we were living. Like the guy that lived next to us worked in Tesco's at night, packing shelves, and mm. you know there was a difference. You know there was a mixture of us in that little yard that there probably isn't anymore because the prices started just shooting up. Mm. You know, our first flat there was £60,000. By the time we sold our one-bedroom flat, we had to move out of the first one because the neighbours, I didn't really like them very much and they didn't like me. They didn't like our cats, so they wanted us to move and it was in the agreement that we weren't allowed to have cats. They never said that when we were buying the place. <laughs> so we moved to Manor Court, which was really nice. I enjoyed living there. It's a beautiful place to live. Look at this last last one um, in the list. Let's look at this one. Uh, this is my, I think this is one of my favourites, and I I love the. I don't know if it is fog in the background, but it feels like it's fog. It's smoke. Yeah, it was a it, fire. It was a yeah, fire. Yeah, I don't know where the smoke was coming from, but it was fire. It was from a fire. Ah, uh, because it really separates them from the background, doesn't it? It makes it look really cool. Do you know these two guys? I guess this is Lee the nineties. The right, he was murdered oh, two no. years after it was taken. Oh, and, God. What's his name? Oh, Lee Crumbs. Oh, and terrible. Colin Doby, he got in contact about a year or two now ago, and he's just died as well. Oh, dear. So this is quite a tragic photograph then, really, isn't it? Where's yeah. this taken? Vauxhall, just off Scotty Road. That's... Yeah. A wine bar that was closed down that's just next to it. Yeah, to... The bottom of there is Latimer Street, where the community centre is, Vauxhall Communi Community Centre used to be, you know, in that brown brick building. Mm. It looks like the 90s, because he's got a Ralph Lauren shirt yeah. on, hasn't he? And I saw it in 1994. I had a job out there, and I had my Yashica camera in my bag, and I just spotted them and asked them if I could take their photograph. It was a strange day because I'd gone to, I was early for the job and I had a half pint in a pub that had all this food lying around and it turned into a week mm. <laughs> as everybody came back and everybody was quite nice to me, but I had to go type of thing. And then I spotted them on my way to the job or on the way back and just asked them if I could take the photograph and they were fine. You know, they yeah. were just hanging around. Funny thing about Lee, though, is that I've got quite a lot of photographs of him from the 80s. Not of him, but of him being in the photograph because he was a bit of a little vandal. So you would see Lee Crumb. You know, <laughs> it, the place was being pulled down, the entire lot of it. So, you know, kids are going to start writing their name all over the place. So Lee's showed up quite a lot. You know, Lee Crumb was here. So, you know, he was. Is that the guy on the right? Colin Doby. Is it, sorry, so Lee Crumb is the one on the left? Uh, no, Lee Crumb's the one on the right. Right, And okay. Colin's the one on the left. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's always tragedy. You know, like, even Colin. Colin used to play in the football and stuff like that as well. But, you know, again, still too young to die. You know, he'd probably just been hitting his 40s. 
you know, a thing about coming from working class backgrounds, you know, where we don't tend to walk. I'm quite good at eating, even though I smoke. But we're not always, men aren't always good at looking after themselves. Mm. So you do get that quite a lot with working class middle aged men, where they just seem to die of preventable things. So what happened is, is that these photographs, this archive that you had assembled when you were a student, didn't see the light of day until recently? About, f- my father had just died, yeah, it'd be about five years ago. Five years ago, so you'd never published them, you had them in your own personal collection, and then all of yeah. a sudden you, you started to publish them. I used them a few it. for portfolios and that, but the thing was that people weren't hiring me to take that kind of photographs. Yeah. So if I went, if I used them for anything, people would just say, well, we don't use this type of photography. You know, if you go and see women's own, they don't, you know, they want smiley, happy or whatever type of people. But they don't want, you know, these sort of photographs aren't, there isn't much of a market for them. Mm. You know, they're a piece of history. Yeah. But, you know, unless you're doing a story on, say, poverty for some magazine, the actual day-to-day life of Breton doesn't really get recorded. But isn't it amazing because... that isn't it amazing that the opportunity came for you to publish this work and for you to receive the recognition for it that you're getting currently? And it, it's fantastic because it's an amazing record for me to look at. And I know a lot oh. of people from Liverpool truly appreciate it and are able to look back at it with you know amazing memories. But it's the art that you've captured as well. It's not just like a snap, is it? You know, it, it's a real moment in history where you've created something that is going to live for a, a long time. And and it, it, I think it adds to the story the fact that it was it was buried until until very recently and that's that must be giving you some some uh, pleasure to have your work recognized and give you a renaissance as a photographer oh of course at this moment it couldn't be you know if i can get back and take photographs again i know now that i'll be able to make 11 doing what i wanted to do when i was 23 which has never been impossible in my life till now i've got a small chance that i may if i can get a kickstarter out of the way i can get enough money in to actually you know, from work now, people have asked me, fashion people and all sorts of people, you know, kind of, you know, would it be available to do a job for them? So if I get back, you know, even things like the Financial Times have been asked, saying that they'll put me on the list. So I could possibly make a living out of this now and go out and take photographs for myself. You left Liverpool. Both my parents had dementia, so... I had to, my da- mum had just died and I was coming back and forth here all the time anyway because my dad also had dementia so I didn't notice it as much at the time because my mum was dying. And once my mum had died, I'd gone, you know, obviously you're up with the funeral and that and you kind of realise that my dad would have gone into an old folks home had I not came up to look after him type of thing. So I held on to him for about sort of six or seven years. You know, even when I came up, he didn't know what my name was. But we had a great time. I, you know, I went down to cancel his newspapers and the woman in the shop was saying, well, who's this with you, William? And he looked at me and he went, I don't know, but he keeps on following me around. And, you know, there was loads of things like that. And I enjoyed that last few years with my dad. Okay, Rob, so we're going to be uh, wrapping it up soon. Um, Tell us about what you're doing now in terms of your future projects as a photographer. What's on the agenda for Rob Bremner? How how do we, you know, help you come back to Liverpool? Well, I'm planning on doing a Kickstarter to see if I could raise the money for a camera and just to cover me for a couple of months in accommodation. What I would really like to do is go back to Everton in North Liverpool and finish that project, re-photograph people that I photographed 30 years ago if they're still alive with their families, like Sharon, you know, like the couple of girls from the cover of that. There are people there that said that I could re-photograph them, but I'd like to photograph the community now with a 30 year gap in between to just see how it's changed, see how the people have changed. But I would like to go on to a wider level where, you know, there's 250,000 people living in Liverpool 
And I don't see any reason if I photograph, what's it, five days a week, 200 people a day for six years, I could photograph everybody in Liverpool and every neighbourhood and take people out on workshops with me and train them. And we could actually have an archive that would, you know, be for future generations. They may not be of interest for another 30 or 40 years, but, you know, I think I would really like to do that. Do you have the Kickstarter already established or is this something that you're looking to do? It's something that I'm looking to do, but I've I've kind of started it. I've only got to do a bit of writing for it. Maybe if you're doing a bit of a video for this, because I need to put a video on it as well, yeah. then I could try doing that. I've got o over 70,000 followers, so I'm hoping that maybe one or two would donate some money to it. If I can't raise the entire amount of the budget, as long as I can get a camera, I'll find a way to get down. You know, mm. I'll sell an extra few prints or something and I'll start it. Once I'm down, I'll see everybody and I've got enough followers. I think it, it sounds like an amazing project. I really think you should get the opportunity to do it because your photographs are fantastic. I love them. I love going through them. And uh, it's been great mm. to speak to you t today about it. Um, yeah, so hopefully by the time we're published and you, you've advanced the kickstarted a little bit more i i'll promote the link on, on my pages if i can and you know i'm yeah. pretty i'm pretty sure that you will um find people to help yeah. bring you back to liverpool and and I, and I really look forward to getting to meet you in, in the flesh when you yeah. come to liverpool. i'm sorry i'm not that articulate about it but i i've never been a lecturer all i all i ask is you you know you get my portrait and it can go to prosterity prosterity <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, it, yeah so you know, I be part of your archive you know um but where can people find you rob o online what's what are your platforms online i'm on instagram so that's rob bremner underscore photographer yeah at Rob Bremner underscore photographer and I'm on Facebook as well and LinkedIn and I noticed you had a website is that your website or has someone done that for you it was just something that I'd put it's really good it's a, it's it's a great selection of your photographs it's really just a flat book that's on it so oh know. I really like it though yeah I went through it before mm. the show today some great stuff on there um yeah great so any last words that you want to tell your followers who are watching this podcast and, and about people who are aspiring to be street photographers, I guess. What, what What's your message to them? Just do it. It's dead easy, but talk to people. You know, it is actually supposed to be about the people that you photograph. It's a great way of passing on memories and recording memories for future generations. You know, it's a great way to spend your year and it's a great way of meeting people and experience in life. So I would recommend to anybody that they took it up. I would recommend taking up photography and just documenting your own environment. And if it leads to something and you do wind up with work out of it, nice one. But if you don't, you're certainly not wasting your time. Mm -hmm. You know, very few of us will be remembered, you know, and it's a great thing to do. You know, most of us, once your grandchildren die, die, you're just going to be forgotten. They'll be the last people that will remember mm. most of us. That's why I think grannies and granddads are always really nice to the grandkids. They'd be nasty <laughs> to the parents. You do that again, I'll whack you. I'll yeah. come here, my little darling, when you're the grandson. Rob Bremner, okay, it's been I a real pleasure. Okay Thank you so much, yeah. and uh, I'll be in touch. Thanks a lot. Wow, you made it to the end. A true supporter. I really hope you enjoyed the show as much as I enjoyed making it. If you want to continue supporting our work and be kept up to date on what we publish, then please sign up to my free newsletter, which I'll send out once or twice a week. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And if you want to support us further, go over to Locals, where you can join our community. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.